Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm recording this on December 3rd, okay? A lot of people have been asking me, do a video about what's going on with the whole pneumonia around the world. Okay, so I'm going to do a series of videos. I have predicted this a long time ago, all right? It's what I have called AIDS-like syndrome, all right? And there's different aspects to AIDS-like syndrome. And I'm going to go, people on X have been asking me to go into detail of what I mean by this. I have on videos that go all the way back to 2020, all right? And in 2021 and 2022, I'm kind of tired of talking about it. But the, the bottom line is this, that there are, uh, there are different things that can go wrong with the immune system, all right? You can get autoimmune disorders, where uh, such such as uh, um, an over an overproduction of of an immune system that it's attacking self, right? Autoimmune disease, or something where the the immune system is is lower, the activity is lower. So you have like two different types, right? Immune system that's overactive and an immune system that's underactive, all right? The one that is underactive is what I call AIDS-like AIDS -like syndrome. The one that is overactive is the autoimmune diseases. That, and they can be through the V or the CV. All right. So uh, I'm going to be try to sound, be generic in this video because I want this one to be up. And it's going to be a series of videos. And we're going we're gonna to create a baseline of understanding of what's going on in the world. My two cents on what's going on, all right, in the mainstream media. And then I will go into detail in another video that probably will not be able to stay up on YouTube because there's a censorship. And you'll have to go to Brighton, BitChute, and Rumble to see the replay of that. But you will be able to see the premiere of it on, on YouTube. All for free. I'm not putting anything behind a paywall. I don't like people that put stuff behind paywalls. Right? I think that's just wrong. If, in, in, you know, if you're, you know, doing a class, you know, you're creating a class about something like, you know, you're, um, you know, doing a master class on something, then, then that makes sense, right? Because you're, you know, you're putting in the effort to, you know, to, you know, make the powerpoints and create all this, this, this scholarly knowledge, right? But if you're covering the news and you're trying to get people to understand what's going on um and how to prepare then that should be free to everybody so please make sure you subscribe to all my channels i have three channels on youtube i have bitchute rumble and uh brighton please subscribe to all those channels the links are in the description of this video and all my videos please make sure that you subscribe or follow on x and in getter um, also please, if you can go to my website, the-studio-reykjavik.com and donate on the homepage. I have Stripe or PayPal that you can donate through at the, on the homepage at the very bottom, or you can donate through buy me a coffee and you can also be a paid subscriber on Patreon for my Patreon channel. That way it helps to cover the news. So all this news is for free for everybody, which I think is the, the right way to go. People that put stuff behind paywalls and do little clips and say, go see the real information. If you're a paid subscriber, I think it's just wrong. Um, but it's through the donations and the people purchasing the products that allows me to do this. So thank you for your support. Please also make sure that you tell your social network, your friends and family to subscribe to all my channels and to follow, follow what I'm saying. I am the most accurate when it comes to this, this, the, the crisis that we just went through in the post era of that crisis than anybody. Now there are other people that have really dived into the names and the, the key actors and all that, and they're doing a good job. But when it comes to the pathology of the crisis, there is nobody, nobody, nobody as good as I am. So, um, okay. So what we're going to do in this video 
he has laid the foundation for what's going on in the mainstream media in my critique of it. Then what we're going to do is go into what is, in another video, what is aids like syndrome and how is that different for autoimmune disease? And then what I think is going on with the current crisis in this post CV era. Okay, I'm not, I'm trying to keep this video on YouTube. So you're going to have to bear with me. Some terms I'm going to use are kind of coded or generic, but um, that's the problem I have with YouTube. You know, I'm extremely censored on YouTube. All right. So, all right. So let's go over a broad brush to get everyone up to speed on what is the issue. Okay. And then we'll go into the details in another video on what AIDS-like syndrome is and how this is a description of a subcategory because AIDS-like syndrome can be adult or pediatric. And there are certain autoimmune diseases that are uh, certain, certain uh, uh, immune dis deficiency diseases, I should say that are just pediatric, and there are some that are more commonly adult. And how that, how those two categories are really under the overall um, umbrella of AIDS-like syndrome. So AIDS-like syndrome is a lower reaction of your immune system, either temporarily or permanent, different, Different cohorts have a different problem, all right? And that sometimes it is in the early phase and sometimes it's more chronic and late. So you gotta keep in mind all the different um, um, possibilities that, that can arise with these different cohort groups, these different types of patients, all right? And when you see, when we create the baseline of knowledge with just the mainstream media, you'll notice that the MDs don't know what they're talking about and that they are not paying attention to something much, much, much bigger. So let's begin. Bear with me. I apologize that I have to separate the, the, this knowledge because the baseline I'm hoping will be able to stay up on YouTube and then the details of what is AIDS-like syndrome will premiere on YouTube but will, will be replayed um, or can be replayed by the backup channels, Brighton, BitChute, and Rumble. I apologize, but the problem is I am heavily censored. I prefer not to be censored so I can keep the, you know, the content on YouTube, but I apologize for that, but it's out of my control. So let's begin. All right, so um, you know my style in terms of PNN, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at Fox 5, right? Remember, we're just gonna look at the, the mainstream media to create a baseline of understanding of what is the issue. And then I'm going to give you the insight that this is what I've been calling AIDS-like syndrome, okay? And I've been calling this AIDS-like syndrome all the way back in 2020. All right, so let's begin. Fox 5, New York. The title of this is Child Pneumonia Outbreak Spreads Worldwide. This was published one day ago. Doctors in parts of the U.S. on high alert after seeing a large uptick in child pneumonia cases that resemble a similar outbreak in China. Fox Eyes Teresa Briola takes a look at the timeline of the illnesses, which some say is eerily similar to the start of COVID. Tis the season to sniffle, sneeze, and cough, especially if you have young kids. And while you might think their virus du jour is a common cold, RSV, or even the flu, you should know both in China, Ohio, and parts of Massachusetts, there's been an uptick of mycoplasma pneumonia. So mycoplasma pneumonia is also known as community-acquired pneumonia or walking pneumonia. You kind of have a low-grade fever, maybe a temp of like 100 or 99, not even really a fever. And, and the kids often just have this lingering, hacking cough, but 
it's not really debilitating. According to Dr. Diane Hess of Gramercy Pediatrics, walking pneumonia is not usually severe in children, and it does not lead to any long-term issues. What is concerning is that in the midst of all the other viruses we're combating, pneumonia cases appear to be on the rise. However, Dr. Hess is not treating a lot of pneumonia cases currently. On the list of things that I'm worried about, mycoplasma pneumonia in children is low. The CDC addressed the outbreaks Thursday. Based on the information we have now, we believe there is no new or novel pathogen that these are related to existing pathogens. The data out of Ohio shows an unusually high number of pediatric Now I'm going to in in interrupt this just for a sec. Pay attention to some of these CDC individuals and the way they use their words and also the way the doctors, the, the clinicians that are treating the patients, um, sometimes these clinicians are flying in the dark. They're doing the best that they can, but just pay attention to the way they phrase terms. And sometimes you have to play the video twice to understand what, they're, what they are saying and what they're not saying. The CDC, nothing new or novel, all right? Now, you gotta remember, we talked about biofire panels and you know, a patient comes in sick, you don't know what it is, and they're testing a whole bunch of stuff. Well, the, the, um, the mycoplasma pneumonia is part of the biofire, okay? There's different versions of biofire, but it's on there, okay? If you are, just imagine you are a doctor and a patient comes in and they're hacking, it's a young child, about three years old, and you don't know what, you don't know what it is. Right, the child, you know, you you you're noticing some symptoms that seem to be potentially a pneumonia. So you do some tests, right? And you do an X-ray. You listen. You do auscultation of the lungs. And you check the heart and all this stuff, right? And it comes back that they're testing positive for mycoplasma, uh, a mycoplasma pneumonia. Okay. Now, and you, that bio, you know, that biofire panel tested for all these other things like RSV, different types of influenza, influenza A, AH1, um, AH1 2009, AH3, you know, so coronavirus, you know, adenovirus, okay? So they're testing a whole bunch. So these patients are coming in with different types of viruses, right? But your patient happens to be this mycoplasma pneumonia or this walking pneumonia, right, situation. And patients normally in your, in your clinic, uh, you know, a few, you know, or several patients a year you'll see having this problem. But all of a sudden you're starting to see three times the amount. Okay, so you're starting to get a little bit worried on like, what is the dynamic? You know, what, so you're a clinician, you don't really know what the dynamic is. Now, all you know is just that what's negative and what's positive on biofire, all right? So this is where the CDC comes in. And the CDC is supposed to surveil incidences and prevalence of certain types of diseases. And if, and here's the key, if, the medical community, especially at the CDC, thinks that there is an unknown pathogen not being recognized through the normal battery of tests like biofire, then they'll do further investigation. But when you have a positive on biofire and a lot of negatives on others, and sometimes these patients may have two types of things, you know, maybe a bacterial infection and mixed with another type of bacterial infection or uh, mixed with a viral infection. So, you know, sometimes you get a viral infection first and then a bacterial infection. So, you, you know, you may get a double positive on biofire, right? But some of these patients, a lot of these patients come in with a, with a, a, a single positive biofire panel. It happens to be in your patient, mycoplasma, all right? All right? Now, in this case, you think the cause is that because you're getting a positive on, on biofire, all right? It's possible because further investigation has not been done and an isolate hasn't been found. 
that another pathogen that's not on the biofire panel could be also part of the cause of the problem. So it may be two things that have to happen that are synergistic. So it could be just mycoplasma or something else, some sort of mechanism, something that happened months before or years before or some sort of a new piece of a pathogen or a, 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 a new pathogen that's flying under the radar of biofire that hasn't, had, that hasn't been isolated yet or an isolate hasn't been produced. So we may be dealing with an unknown. It could be just mycoplasma or we could be dealing with something unknown, a mechanism or a pathogen, right? That, that is allowing for the mycoplasma incidences to rise, okay? Keep that in mind, all right? So when they say they haven't found a new one, it basically means, or a novel one, that means that their biofire panel is lighting up and they're seeing RSV, influenza, adenovirus, coronavirus, and mycoplasma, all right? But, but they didn't go further to make sure there's nothing novel in the, in the sputum, you know, this coughing up this, this fluid, right? Hasn't been found, nothing's been sequenced. Doesn't mean it's not there. Keep that in mind, all right? I'm not saying this, I'm just saying, just keep that in mind that they have all, what they're really, when they say we haven't found anything new, what they're saying is we can attribute the disease to a particular positive on biofire. All right. But there may be some synergistic mechanism or synergistic pathogen that has that's flying underneath the radar of biofire. Keep that in mind. The case is this fall, 145 since August. The average patient is around eight years old. No deaths have been reported. The illnesses are no more severe than in previous years. In Denmark, they're saying cases have reached epidemic levels. And in China, there's been a surge of hospital admissions. When it comes to treating pneumonia, your kid is going to need an antibiotic. So you'll go to the doctor for that. But as far as over-the-counter medication goes, Dr. Hess tells us you want to look for a children's cough suppressant, but really what you want is the expectorant. You want to get that mucus out of their chest. In Montclair, New Jersey, Teresa Briello, Fox 5 News. Okay. So now a little bit of anatomy or right, in physiology. Children have a larger thymus. Adults, their thymus shrinks almost to nothing. Why? Why is that? There's an evolutionary reason why. When you're young, the transformation was absolutely incredible. The spine surge and that HSS complete. When you are a child, you are exposed to a lot of pathogens that you've never been exposed to before because you're, you're new, right? You're a newborn or you're one or two years old, okay? So your immune system doesn't work really well when between being a newborn to about six months of, of age, okay? And you only can produce IgMs, okay? In general, okay? I'm speaking in general terms. Your immune system isn't as robust and it's, it's not long lasting between your first six months of life. But beyond that six months of life, you, you start to kick in memory, all right? And you start to be able to produce IgGs and other types of antibodies, all right? These antibodies are important especially if you had re-exposure to that pathogen to build immunity and memory, all right? And so you build up these plasma cells that produce antibodies. So when you're young and you're biting the dirt and you're getting all sick all the time, but what you're doing is you're really building up a memory, T cell and B cell memories, all right? For later down the road that where you may be exposed 10 years or 20 years later, right? And over time, your immune system um, is 
weak because you're just newborn. And then all of a sudden over time, it gets better and better and better. But then as you, you know, get older, about 65, you know, assuming that you're, you're on the American diet, um, you know, then your immune system starts to go down and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. All right. So you're probably, you know, you're probably the healthiest, probably anywhere from 25 to about 45 in terms of immune system, assuming that you don't have some sort of autoimmune disease and been exposed to something that, that wrecks it up. All right. Just in general. So when we're adults, our thymus shrinks. Now we have the thymus is important for T cells, all right, and and you know helping with um, produce going through the activation to produce antibodies. So you have and your your precur your precursor non activated B cells are coming from your bone. Okay, so you have. You have B cells primarily starting out or, or the genesis of them are in the bone and the T cells are the genesis from the thymus in general. All right. There's a little, there are some nuances, all right? I probably should do a masterclass on immunology and cancer, which is something I can do, but, but all right. So, um, so we have this organ this thymus or gland. I think it's a gland. It's not. It's not secreting a hormone. It would be an organ. So this organ that shrinks over time when you get older. When you're older, the assumption during the evolutionary process was that you are exposed to your environment mostly while you were a child, partially in adolescence, partially in your you know, t t early 20s, and you're going to stay local, all right? Because evolution was pretty much a non-global phenomenon, right? It was a localization phenomenon. So your body is saying, I don't need to waste all this energy in producing more antibodies because I'm already pretty much exposed to everything I'm going to be probably seeing, all right? And then your thymus starts to shrink, all right, over time to the point where it's very hard to find it. <laughs> it's probably there, but it's very, very hard to find it. And you have these memory cells, all right, and it becomes even problematic when you really get into your, you know, 70s and 80s where you're exposed to something new where your memory has gone away and now it's hard for you to fight it because your immune system isn't as robust as when it was when it was in the 20s. So just keep that in mind that you have a child that has a robust system right after eight, age after six months. It's not very robust in the first six months, but after six months all the way to a year, um, it's more robust and it's really kicked in age two and three, all right? And you're building up this memory, and these kids are getting sick, and they're building up the, these antibodies, right? They're building up their ad adaptive uh, immunity. As we get older, that thymus is shrinking, and our ability to adapt to something new is reduced. Because the assumption is, is that not a whole lot of new stuff is going to happen when you get past 45, 50 years old. Okay, so that's the evolutionary thing aspect of the thymus. Now, why is this important? It is important because children, and you notice, listen to the age group, age three to eight, have a, their thymus is really active. All right. Well, what if, so you have this active group, normally the thymus is active when, you know, they're exposed to a pathogen. And then you have a group that's older, let's say geriatric, where the thymus is shrunk quite a bit and they have a depleted immune system, naturally. Now, what if they're exposed to something like CV or V and that thymus can no longer be as active in the child? What will happen is, is that you'll have lower activity in the immune system to be able to fight infection compared to baseline. Baseline would be 
a normal three to eight year old thymus. All right. And in the older group, if you were exposed to something like CV or V, and you had, you know, your natural thymus is shrunk and you were healthy up to the point of being exposed to either of the, the two things or both, your immune system can potentially be even lowered. Okay. So <clears throat> your baseline is just a lower immune system compared to when you were 40. Everyone would agree with that. Well, independent of getting anything. Now you're geriatric and you've contracted or contracted something or been inoculated for something. And now it's potential where your immune system is, activity is lower from your baseline. Both situations will cause, even if it's just a little bit of a weakening of the immune system, will cause opportunistic infections to take hold. And these opportunistic infections are viruses, bacteria, fungal infections, and parasitic infections, okay? Now, <clears throat> in the post-CV era, we saw and are seeing for certain cohorts a, a lowering of the immune system, especially in the young and in the old. Now, the reason being is because there's mechanisms, and I'll go into detail on what those are in another video because that video won't be able to stay up on YouTube. Um, and they, they, uh, what's the mechanism of weakening the immune system, either short term or long term, either acute or in some sort of latent chronic way? Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, now people would say, well, there are people that are in the middle that don't seem to have this too much of a problem. Well, they're their, uh, their thymus is starting to shrink and their immune system is in a sweet spot where it can still adapt compared to the geriatric group. And they're not as active as a child. So there's a sweet spot between around, you know, age 25 to 45 where, you know, you don't have that much of a, you have activity, but, you know, you can, you can adapt because it's not as, it, it, there is some activity, but if you are a little bit weakened, you can, you won't see as much of it because with a child, it's much more pr pronounced because of the high activity between age, you know, six, six months to age two or, you know, three years of old to eight because of all the pathogens that are surrounded by and comparing it, it to baseline and comparing the baseline of of um, the geriatrics that have a, a weakening of, the, um, of their immune system naturally because they're getting older, all right? So you have one group, the geriatrics that, you know, they don't have, they don't have a, a, any buffer to, to absorb the shock. But with the children, they need a overactive, <clears throat> immune system to be able to fight all the things that they're contracting. So you're, so if you're contracting a lot of different things and you have somewhat of a weakened immune system, then some of these other opportunistic infections can pop, pop up. If you're in the middle sweet spot, 25 to about 45, you have enough cushion because you have still a, a reactive you still have an active, reactive kind of immune system compared to baseline, right? And, but it's not overreactive. So you may see some sort of, in some of these cohorts, you know, some people may get it, but it won't be as prevalent, is my point. And the reason why that is, is that one, you're in a sweet spot in terms of your reactivity of your, your body. So you may not necessarily see it happening to you, even though it is happening. 
It's just not as obvious. In addition, for some people, their immune system isn't as good as it should be because of lifestyle. And those are the ones that push their, even though they may be 40 years old, they may be actually in the 60 age category in terms of immune robustness, all right, because of lifestyle. So there's these dynamics. I'll go into detail on why this is, but people need to pay attention. AIDS like syndrome. Okay. So now let's go to the um, let's go to Fox News five days ago. Show your daughter how much you love her with this beautiful gift. It says, to my daughter, never. Meanwhile, take a look at this. Shocking scenes from hospitals in China, overwhelmed with patients with some sort of respiratory illness. The country's health ministry is insisting that this is not a new virus, but it's a combination of the flu and other bad stuff. This is Washington, D.C. area hospitals and clinics are reportedly seeing an up to the flu and some other bad stuff. I mean, that's I, I tell you, these teleprompter readers are just asinine sometimes. In sick visits. So could the two be connected? And do we need to be concerned here in the United States? Here with this take, Fox News medical contributor, Dr. Mark Siegel, who joins us today for Rome. Uh, Bonjour, now, Dr. Siegel. First of all, Steve, I got to tell you, the lasagna is pretty good here in Rome, but it is not as good as yours, and it is definitely not as good as Ainsley's. I got to get that on the record. All right, thank you. Of what's happening in China, I want to say this. If, when, we, when you hear that children are being hospitalized in northern China of mysterious pneumonia, right. and the WHO is telling you everything is okay, and China's saying no problem, well, here in the United States, excuse us if we don't necessarily believe any of that because we've been lied to so much by China and the WHO has carried water for them and did so with the pandemic. However, having said that, Steve, I looked very closely at this and I think we're experiencing in China what we experienced here last year, which is something called immune pause. Remember they locked down all through 2022? Right. Well, you relieved them. So... Let me dissect what he's saying. First, last year, if you remember, we were covering on the channel the RSV and the MPOX. Okay. Um, and even two years ago with MPOX, right? Or a year and a half ago. So RSV, and what was happening was that uh, they were happening in, in younger children with the RSV. And there were some um, issues with MPOX, with pediatrics, but definitely with adults, there were some adult issues. And they were saying that it was homosexual, homosexual practices that seemed to be in that group to be more prevalent for the, M the MPOX incidences. And I stated a year and a half ago that that was one of the signs in the United States of this lower immune system that I call AIDS-like syndrome, allowing for opportunistic infections to take hold, okay? Now you gotta remember, some of these people that were getting the impox, they were saying in their community that, um, that the, the PrEP um, medication seemed to be exacerbating the situation, all right? So there may be some issue with PrEP or the cocktail for HIV that may be helping this along with MPOX, all right? Then kind of MPOX died down. It kind of re it reached like, I'm trying to remember like 20,000 cases, 25,000 cases in the United States, somewhere other. And, and then it, di it died down, all right? Maybe a little less, but it, you know, around there, maybe 15,000, but, but there, somewhere in there. And, and the RSV lasted for a few months and then died off. There were some cases where children needed to have liver transplants. Okay. Now, 
that was a data point that was happening a year and a half ago in the United States. That was happening before the opening of the society with China. Right? Remember, they had zero COVID policy, and they opened up and they had the big surge, and there was the, the white lung. All right. Now, so we have those data points, and then he uses the term immune pause because, well, if you're sheltered in place or if you're over masking and you're not exposed to regular pathogens in your community, don't be surprised that this, there's a surge, okay? Well, this is the reason why this pause is a poor explanation. And that the AIDS-like syndrome is a better explanation. The reason being is, is that you had multiple countries that were way past their shelter-in-place policies or their masking mandates. And you are now seeing a surge of similar dynamics taking place in the United States, in Denmark, in the UK, I've heard cases in Germany, I've heard cases, but I haven't been able to see it in the news uh, about Australia. Um, there are countries that are on, you know, on the watch, like India. India is going to be a bellwether. Um, and so you have similar dynamics that are happening in China, in other countries, and those countries stop their mandate and shelter in place or never had it way, way before China did. So there's something different going on. So immune pause is not the issue. Immune issue, an immune issue, an immune, a reduction in the immune system, especially in geriatrics and in pediatrics, all right? So those, those are the data points to pay attention to. Lockdowns and viruses, upper respiratory viruses, RSV, influenza, COVID, come roaring back. And one more thing, Nature, the journal Nature, has a tremendous article over this week about a bug called mycoplasma, which is a bacteria. And guess what they're doing in China? They're flooding this bacteria with a Z-pack. And when you give a Z-pack to too many people, you get a resistant mycoplasma and you can end up in the hospital. So I think... The combination of all... So his point is right on. And I made a tweet this morning about the resistance issue, all right, of mycoplasma, pneumonia. You have a lot of cases in China because of this AIDS-like syndrome. And they test and they find out, oh, this is the pathogen we're going to... Uh, we're going to bombard it with these types of antibiotics or this type of viral treatment or whatever, okay, depending on what the patient has. But in this case, let's say the micro, the, the mycoplasma, all right, pneumonia. And they throw it, the z pack, all right? And now, because you have so many people in China having this issue, and you are over prescribing it at the societal level, there's selection pressure for mutation. And what will happen is the mycoplasma will end up being resistant to many of the antibiotics that we have. All right. And we then what will have will happen is, is that you're gonna have a MERS kind of not a MERS, but uh, a MRSA kind of situation that takes place, you're going to get a bacteria that is resistant to more of the antibiotics that we have, and you'll have to use exotic antibiotics up to the point where they may not be even usable. So the worry here is, is that there's a cascade of events. You have something, remember what I said, these people have a mechanism or have been co contracted some something that has lowered their immune system, either in the past or in the present, okay? 
And that immune system has now allowed for an opportunistic infection to take hold. You have so many of them in a large population like China using the same therapy that it will create selection pressure for the mycoplasma to end up being resistant to the antibiotics and the antibiotics that we have. So people need to realize this really profound concept, all right? There are two things that will put you into the dark ages. Loss of antibiotics and the loss of electricity. Those two things is what, and probably plastics, all right? Those three things are what we, what really is the foundation of our modern society. Electricity, plastics, because if it wasn't for plastics, a lot of medicine wouldn't work, all right? And, and antibiotics. So we had this event that took place in 2020. Now it's created a situation where you have a deficient immune system, temporarily for some, permanent for others, acute and chronic, and it leads to a situation where you have to use antibiotics to try to clear an infection at the societal level in mass that leads to mutations where our antibi antibiotics will not work as well. So there is a there is a secondary effect from what just happened in 2020 with the def deficiency in the immune system. And then there's a tertiary effect of a mutation of opportunistic pathogens that will lead to a further crisis. People need to pay attention. I said that the world is going through a dark time and that the cloud started over the world on December 1st. And that there are going to be people that think what I'm going to be saying in this part of the video, you know, they won't agree with me and that's okay. We are seeing physical manifestations that we can describe in terms of our terminology and science that is being used, the physical manifestations of it is being used as the curse of why humans should be punished. There's this mechanism. And so it's not gonna be as bad as let's say, you know, the, the plagues of Egypt, right? In biblical times. But you're gonna see things similar. And you, it's hard to describe what I'm saying here. There's a physical manifestation that we can describe through science, but there's also a spiritual component that, that fewer people see and, can, and, and realize that mankind is being judged because of wrongdoings, you know, doing things we shouldn't be doing, like killing children in the womb, making pathogens and releasing them and, and you know, having governments that, that uh, aren't really fully following democracy, especially during the, the voting season. Um, you know, you have a lot of different things that are happening. So the, the entanglement of social media and how it created a cesspool, or what I call the infestation. You know, mankind is moving in a negative direction, not in a positive direction. There needs to there, there's a judgment. There's a there's a celestial judgment that is taking place here, and it's going to th be through the manifestation of war, plague, famine. Okay, so we're seeing the the emergence of a, of, a, of human activity that happened in 2020 through the nefarious acts of the national security state having secondary and tertiary effects that are, are, are of the plague, 
are of a plague, of a, a curse because of mankind. All right. So, you know, we'll, you know, we can spend a lot of time on the details of the science, but there's also a metaphysical component here that's really important. And, you know, these people that want to be, you know, the Aristotle types, you know, I can understand, you know, it's, it's not easy to digest the, the, the metaphysical component to this, but mankind is being judged. And it's, there's so many things that have happened between November 29th, November 30th, December 1st, December 2nd, that is setting in motion these secondary and tertiary things that are going to happen in terms of war, world war, in terms of economic instability and uh, in, uh, and um, pathogenic stability, if, if you want to use that as a term. All right. things, especially mycoplasma, is our answer here, but of course I can't be sure of what's coming out of China. Sure, and absolutely, and you know, you, you take uh, what the WHO uh, says with a grain of salt, you said, but uh, to the point earlier, Dr. Siegel, before you went over to uh, Italy, uh, you saw, you've seen here in the United States, the number of people with particularly, uh, I was talking to our ENT, Dr. Remsen, the other day, he said everybody who was going to his office has like laryngitis or tracheitis, I think is what he called it. Is that just something that is new or is this something that, um, you know, we see every year at this time? It's I don't new. know what he's going to say. I don't know what he's going to say, but I'll tell you th this. People are too focused on, is this a new pathogen? It doesn't have to be a new pathogen. Is it a new incident rate? Is the prevalence increasing? Is the severity of it worse? That is the better question. Because that would be further data points to understand what the dynamics are. And I'm telling you, this is AIDS-like syndrome. Opportunity, your immune system is down and opportunistic infections take hold. And then there are sec there are tertiary effects because of the way we treat it that leads to mutation. All right. And because of what happened in, you know, in 2020 and, you know, the arc of development that goes all the way back to 2001 and even to the mid 80s. All right. Just for the, you know, the pathogen that we were worried about recently. And all the, th all the nefarious things that the national security state does, you know, and we just saw the death of Kissinger and all the things that he did, all right? Mankind is being judged. And we're being judged on different levels. And there are these, it, I see this as, as events in human history that are not disparate. The war in Israel and what we just went through in 2020 are not disparate. They're t together. There's a, there's a, there's a continuation of a curse that is going to start to gain speed. It's going to start to gain momentum. All right, and that, and it, and for the ones that aren't prepared emotionally and spiritually are going to be in a lot of fear. Don't fear it, but it's going to happen. Don't pretend that it ain't going to happen. Um, and and you know you'll you'll do better. But mankind is there's a judgment that's taking place here. But there, it's real. There's a physical element to it. All right. But to and it's a combination of the things I've said so far, especially RSV is pretty rampant this year. The one thing I didn't mention is strep, and there's a lot of strep around, and we have and we have a shortage of antibiotics for streps, amoxicillin especially. So we're seeing that, and so if you're going to your eats, so if you not only are China overusing ZPAC, 
but we have antibiotics that are we're short on other pathogens. All right, so your incidences for certain pathogens are going to go up either way because of a lack of antibiotics or because of mutation where the antibiotics don't work anymore. And people need to pay attention. We're in the 21st century because of some key foundational principles. Plastics, electricity, antibiotics. You take any one of those out and your society is going to start to crumble, especially electricity. And you have that raspy throat. He needs to he or she needs to test you to make sure you don't have strep. Because that's one thing we can really treat. We can treat mycoplasma. We can treat strep. If you're in a high risk group, by the way, over the age of 60, 65, you should be getting your pneumonia shot. And we also now have an RSV shot out. So and flu. So these are things you need to talk to your doctor about and get to the right decision. All right, uh, Dr. Mark Siegel on the road today, sir. Thank you very much for joining us live. Save me some lasagna, Ainsley. I need a lasagna. You know, if someone asks me, you know, should they get the RSV shot or should they get, you know, a flu shot? I would say because of the crisis that we went through and most likely you have been vaccinated through because of the, the crisis, I would not do it. There are too many unknowns and that I think that our understanding of the potentiality of over-vaccinating and how it affects the immune system <clears throat> um, is really in its nascent stage. All right, next. All right, let's take a look. This is ABC, the CDC monitoring. This is uh, four days ago. I wish for the amazing new iPhone 15 Pro. You mean this one, the one with titanium? Switch to Verizon. You can trade in any iPhone and get the new iPhone 15 Pro on them. It's your last chance to trade in any iPhone for a new iPhone 15 Pro on us, only on Verizon. And it's time now for Patel. This is PNN, and we had to force a commercial and that I didn't want it, so I'm going to make a commercial for myself. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. The link is in the description of this video. It's the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nano silver soaps. I have five different varieties. This one is lavender, okay? This has the structural nano silver. It neutralizes pathogens so you don't smell like Alex Jones. Right. And this one is, this is lemongrass, right? So go to the store, take a look at the different varieties I have, and get that structural nano silver soap. It's great for a stocking stuffer for the holidays. Get a couple bars of it. Go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. In addition, please go to the store and also get ashwagandha root. This helps to control your blood glucose levels. You're going to be eating a lot of cookies during the holiday season and cake and ice cream and everything else that has too much sugar in it. It's going to give you inflammation. You want to control that blood glucose level. Take ashwagandha. If you take ashwagandha every, every day, what it'll do is it'll control your blood glucose levels and you'll start to bring down that inflammatory response on your vascular system because of the high glucose level. If you take it with turmeric, then it's even better. So please go to my store and get the ashwagandha root to control your blood glucose levels and don't eat many, so many damn cookies during the holidays. This is King and Anne. It is where Dr. Alok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today we're talking about a surge of respiratory illnesses in China. The flu, RSV, and other infections have been sweeping across some parts of the country as China experiences its first full winter since easing COVID-19 restrictions. Here's Dr. Patel with what you need to know. If you hear possible mystery respiratory illness, you might get a flashback to four years ago before the world knew COVID-19. So when headlines talk about a rise in respiratory illnesses in children in China, people have questions. 
Here's an overview of what we know. In October, the World Health Organization. Yeah, I, mean, I saw this video and he, I understand he tries to be basic for the general crowd, but there are some serious holes in his logic. Monitoring data showing this trend from Chinese surveillance systems. In mid-November, Chinese officials attributed the cases to lifted restrictions and viruses that come with the season. Now the World Health Organization says that the causes are mycoplasma, a common cause of pneumonia, RSV, adenovirus, and influenza, and not any new or unusual bacteria or viruses. Okay. Let's reiterate what I said. Biofire pops up positive for certain for certain things. That patient comes in, it turns positive, and then you treat it, it seems to be getting better, and that seems to be the confirmation. There's no follow-up that there's something else floating around that may be synergistic. That's one problem. Problem number two is, is that this is not just happening in China. It's happening in the United States right now. This video that's being played was done four days ago. So if it was just China, then I would agree that it had some unique dynamic in terms of immune pause. But that's not the case. It's across the across the world. There's a and, and it's happening in the geriatric population, and it's happening primarily in the pediatric population. All right. That is very concerning. That is showing data points that is proving the theory of AIDS-like syndrome in the post, you know, CV era, right? I'm trying to be generic for my words so it can stay on YouTube. But the, there was no, they're doing surveillance because what the protocol is basically, oh, you got a lot of people getting sick and biofire starts to light up. Well, you know, you have 30% of the population getting RSV, you know, another 20% getting um, uh, influenza and, and the 50% getting mycoplasma. Okay. All right. And you treat that. There's no real follow-up of finding new isolates or isolating, you know, new bacteria. Because they think that their positive test is conclusive and comprehensive. It's not. That's a major problem. That's, that, that, people need to pay attention on this. Now, it could be just those. But no one's following up to make sure. I'm gonna be really honest with you guys, all right? I have not met one MD or resident that likes their job. Not one, not one. It's very telling when doctors can create podcasts and, and do radio shows, they'll be gravitating to that more than their actual practice. And three, a lot of doctors MDs, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They have been, there's the training is so pigeonholed into a certain testing regime that they can't think out of the box because the only way they can get through that is to, to have horse blinds. And so by the time they're in practice, they have horse blinds that, that are literally not just glued to their head. They've, they, they, they've morphed. Their, their skin tissue morphed around the horse blinds and it's part of their, their, their anatomy. He's one of them. That's a relief. It is, but there's still a lot of respiratory disease out there. When restrictions are lifted and kids are back to being kids and there's increased surveillance like in Northern China, this isn't that surprising. This is similar to what happened in the United States last year. Remember all those warnings about the triple demic? And maybe now we're just all on heightened alert. And that's not a bad thing. It's important to pay attention to keep you and your loved ones protected. Now pay attention to this. 
they're happening at the same time. That's the issue. We were out of, quote, immune pause way before China. And the magnitude of the immune pause, if that's actually true, is much higher with China. All right. And our cases, we should be back to baseline, the average, not an uptick. We have an uptick. We have an uptick in RSV. We have an uptick in mycoplasma. We have an uptick in influence. We have an uptick, all right, of these pathogens. Not back to baseline, pre COVID era. That's an important piece here. And why I keep on saying it's AIDS like syndrome and how it can be subdivided into skid and right for the pediatric group. Ten states, including New York City and Puerto Rico, are experiencing high or very high levels of respiratory illness activity. So make sure you get all your vaccines if you haven't already. And if you have any cold symptoms, please stay home. Don't spread it to others. If your kids are sick, be sure to keep them home. If you're sick, stay home. Stay away from these damn vaccines until we actually really understand the synergistic effects of what we just went through. Because if you keep on piling on, to the immune deficiency that I am saying is happening, you may make it worse. Not in school. And I know this can be kind of inconvenient because these adorable little creatures seem like they get sick often, but it's a really good move for public health. So please and thank you. Oh Lord, show America how you cough in your elbow. Good job. <laughs> Uh, your assistant is the best. Dr. Luke Patel joins me now for more. Uh, so what's happening in China? Is this just to be expected after living COVID, after lifting, I should say, COVID restrictions? Or is there cause for concern here? No, it certainly isn't that surprising based on what is happening when you have this first full winter with all those viruses since lifting restrictions, which China did earlier this year. And I, people may see this reminiscent as what happened here domestically about a year ago when we had this large early influx of cases in children with RSV, influenza, and other viruses with some public health experts attributing to what they call an immunity gap. I understand what the cause for concern because previous epidemics from flu strains, SARS, COVID-19, all started out with mystery cases of pneumonia. But now that the World Health Organization has actually seen lab and epidemiologic data and has confirmed that this is most likely related to RSV, adenovirus, influenza, and mycoplasma, people should be able to breathe a little sigh of relief because there is no unusual or creepy stray out there. Okay, there's nothing new. There's nothing novel at this moment in time. Okay, Doc. What about the actual immune system in really showing what those CD4 counts are? What are those natural killer cell counts are? What are, you know, the positive eight CD cells? What are they? And it's not about just the count. It's about the effectiveness of them. And this is the point that I think George Webb was making. When you have sub-super antigens or super antigen-like things that are happening, now in the post-CV era, okay, because of the V and the CV, right? Because we have a, a sequence that when split, when cleaved on the S1 subunit, will attach to a CD4 positive cell on the TCR. Well, that's an inhibitor. Well, if you're inhibiting your CD4, then that means that your effective CD4 count is going down. So, doctor, why don't you look into it? See, the problem is, is that these people that are on these mainstream news networks, they're just talking. They're just, oh, this is nothing new. Just go get your vaccine. That's what he's promoting. And not going into the details 
that actually it 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 is highly probable that there is an immune deficiency that's taking place at at the very minimum that's temporary, and this may potentially be long lasting. Here's a weird thing that 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 I've been saying, and I was thinking about it actually today, but I've been saying it for a couple of years now. You may have been okay during the crisis, and you're in that that sweet spot in the immune system where it's you know 25 to you know 45. All right. You fast forward it to 20 years, especially in your tail end of that. Let's say in your 40s, and you fast forward, and you now you're falling into the geriatric category. We don't know the life expectancy for the ones that are were in the sweet spot when they go in their geriatric years and their immune system naturally starts to go down. Or how these children that went through the crisis, when they go into the sweet spot 20 years later, let's say they're 10 years old and they fared okay, and they get to age 40, or 30, do they have as a robust immune system as they should compared to the average baseline today or the average baseline pre-COVID? We don't know. I'm telling you, it's about the horse blinds and I know why this is happening, it's the testing. The way they test the docs to get the certification is what creates people like this. They can't think out of the box. There were two, well, there were about three types of doctors, all right, that MDs that were out there during the crisis and LDs, uh, um, DOs. Um, three types, all right? You had ones that were worried about the crisis because it might close down their their clinic and they were worried about cash flow and so they tried to say that it didn't exist oh keep that in mind all right they were worried about the money cash flow two all right you had the ones that had no idea what was going on and just were mouthpieces for the cdc or they were you know just you know, they just did whatever the CDC tells them because that's what, you know, that's, you know, they read it in the book, all right? They're not using the brain. And in the, in the third category are the ones that were, you know, kind of part of the apparatus of the national security state and part of this whole defense program. You know, this guy falls in the middle category. It's just a mouthpiece. Just, just, there's not a real, there's not real thinking. Where's the real, we need thinking people. Thinking people. We don't need MDs, we need thinking people. All right, I think most of us have heard of some of the other things you mentioned, like RSV, adenovirus, but can you talk more about mycoplasma? What is it and what are the signs? My phone has been blowing up, Diane, with people asking about this because people are like, oh my gosh, what is mycoplasma? Now, mycoplasma is not the notorious celebrity as some of the other respiratory viruses because oftentimes it causes a mild cold and people never actually get tested or even need to see medical care. No, 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 no. Let's pay attention because you need to put your thinking hat on. There's there's a term out there, walking pneumonia because they don't think that it's that bad. Okay. And a lot of people don't need to be treated. Then all of a sudden you need a whole bunch of people being treated. Isn't that cause for concern? Either because it's resistant to treatment and it's more virulent, you know, it has more of a, uh, a, a, um, a spreading effect. People need to pay attention our immune systems have been trashed because of the C, V, and the V, and or, or both, maybe even synergistic. But you know, the point is, is that the immune system has been trashed. Ask anybody that, that, that I know people that have died both ways, through the V and through the C, V without the V. 
right? You know, I just, so it's nothing, it's not novel. What's novel is the prevalence. What's novel is the timing. What's novel is the regions that it's happening in. We were already out of our immune gap, as he phrases it, or paused immunity. It's AIDS like syndrome. And I said this was going to happen in 2020. In cases a year, usually in kids, this presents as something we call tracheobronchitis, which is a fancy word for chest cold. So think sore throat, cough, maybe feeling a run down. Now, sometimes mycoplasma can progress into pneumonia. Signs to watch out for, for that would include fever, chills, coughing, and shortness of breath. Now, oftentimes in doctor lingo, we call this atypical pneumonia or walking pneumonia because people seem fine. But if you have any of these symptoms and they're lingering for a long period of time, you may want to see a doctor to make sure that it's nothing more serious and you may need antibiotics. And what about the flu shot? How effective is it this year and when should we get it? Well, if you haven't gotten it already, do so right now. In fact, get your flu shot, your COVID-19 booster, your RSV, if you're eligible. It takes about two weeks to get full protection. You want to get that done before all the holiday shenanigans. Now, in terms of effectiveness, we don't have data for this year, but here's an important finding from last year. Last year, we had one of the worst- Go get it, but we don't know how effective it is. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean about these doctors? They don't know shit. Since 2019, H1N1, about 50,000 kids getting hospitalized. But recent data from the CDC shows that that flu vaccine cut the risk of kids needing medical interventions in the ER, urgent care, or getting hospitalized by about 50%. That's big. And even if you get the flu after getting the flu shot, you are much less likely to wind up in the ER. I compare it to seatbelts. Yes, you might be able to drive without a seatbelt and be fine, but guess what? If you wear one, you're much less likely to be in a bad situation needing to go to the ER. So get your shots. All right, Dr. Patel, thank you. Our society is going to wake up to the fact that we're over-boosting and over-vaccinating the public. The other, the problem is, is that you have a group now out there that is so anti-vax that they don't want to do anything. Both sides are wrong. Over vaccine is bad. Under vaccine is bad. Proper vaccine is good. But we're way past that. <laughs> don't get any of it yet until things start to settle down. I'm telling you, don't, 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 don't. This guy is not an immun immunologist. This guy, just through his, the way he has answered the questions, has a lot of issues that I have just explained to, to the viewers. He's not, he doesn't have his thinking cap on. He's in autopilot. And that's what got us down the road that we were in before. Remember the three types of doctors saying it didn't exist because they wanted to keep their practice open. You know, the ones that are like him, they're just mouthpieces for the CDC. And whatever, you know, whatever the FDA and the CDC says is what he'll do. And not using his thinking cap. And then the nefarious ones. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is why, this is why we're being judged. You want to now apply the metaphysics of this because the metaphysics will manifest manif there, there will be a manifestation in the physical all right this is why we're seeing what we're seeing mankind is really really off the rails remember dr patel is here to take your questions too so just leave a message on our instagram feed at ABC News Live, and you might answer your question right here on Friday. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. Stephanopoulos is another dipshit.
All right, we're going to take a look at the business channel, the CNBC. Oh, wait, let's, before we do that, let's. Let's go to CBS Evening News two days ago, Ohio cases. Now a children's health emergency as Ohio is now the first state in the nation to report an outbreak of pediatric pneumonia cases. Doctors say the white lung syndrome is similar to the respiratory illnesses already sweeping China and parts of Europe. CBS's Meg Oliver has advice for parents on how to keep their children safe. The beginning of an outbreak. That supposedly we don't have an immune gap anymore. Or an immune pause. Why does that happen? Oh, oh, AIDS like syndrome. In Warren County, north of Cincinnati, health officials have declared an outbreak of pneumonia in children. They say 145 kids have been diagnosed with a respiratory infection since August. The average age of these patients is eight years old. The declaration comes as China is in the midst of its own outbreak. The U.S. is trying to avoid scenes like this. Hospital wards filled to capacity with doctors seeing a rise in several known respiratory illnesses. Today, the director of the CDC tried to ease fears, saying China is not dealing with a new virus like COVID. We do not believe this is a new or novel pathogen. We believe this is all existing. CBS News medical contributor Dr. Celine Gounder says while the outbreaks are similar, they're not connected. In both cases, we're seeing an increase in the usual viruses and bacteria that we see circulating in the community every year. To keep your child from getting a more serious lung infection like pneumonia, we're seeing an increase in the same types of things. So that means that an opportunistic infection at the societal level is now becoming more prevalent because you have a weakened immune system, probably temporarily for these, for these pediatric patients, but we don't know. It may get worse, especially when you overboost the fuckers. It is best to get kids shots against viruses like the flu, COVID, and RSV. While these viruses may not kill children and infants, they do leave these kids more vulnerable uh, both to viral pneumonia as well as bacterial pneumonia. Doctors say in most cases, bacterial pneumonia can be treated with antibiotics and doesn't require hospitalization. And while some communities are seeing an uptick in cases, Keep in mind, we are in the middle of cold and flu season. Nora, that's important to remember, Meg Oliver, thank you. That data point is proving my point there. I promise, as an independent advisor, to put the financial well-being of you and your family first. I promise to serve, I not sell. I promise. am a fiduciary. You hate this, these commercials anymore. Respiratory uh, illnesses surging across the U.S. Ohio becoming the first state in the U.S. to report uh, an uptick in pediatric pneumonia. For more on this and the respiratory surge in China, let's bring in Dr. Kavita Patel, a professor of medicine at Stanford University and a contributor uh, with NBC News and MSNBC. Uh, thanks for joining us. In, I'm just trying to figure out, doctor, whether this is uh, truly I have a feeling she's the yeah. wife of the previous doctor that we just saw. Just much more in tune with, with these type of things following the pandemic because there's an RSV season every year, I think, and there's the companies that have been working on RSV vaccines from long before COVID and the pandemic. So we, we've seen this before. Is this different? Is this worse? Yeah, Joe, so what's unfolding in the United States, I, I don't think is much worse. We, of course, have to monitor it. I'm sure we're going to hear about cases of kind of overcrowded pediatric emergency rooms around the country. And we know that it's not from a novel virus or some version of COVID that should scare the world. It's really from kind of the mix of respiratory viruses, things we're getting used to. And you're, you're right, Joe, this is 
kind of a calibration of what had come out of the pandemic. Remember a year ago, we had the triple demic with all of these viruses kind of thinking at the same time because of the way the viruses just unfolded across the country. And we're seeing a little bit of that now. A Stanford doctor. can't explain what I just explained to you. And they poo-poo it away. What la happened last year is just some sort of strange phenomena that three things were happening at the same time with this triple epidemic that we had in the United States. And then something is happening more worldwide now. No, I think it's actually the immune system, honey. I'm really sure of it. I tell you, these doctors. When you hear, when you when you see a doctor like this, you you. I'm not talking about on Twitter or on you know social media. But when you go see your doctor and you're not feeling well or your kid's not feeling well, you need to start questioning, questioning, and saying how. Let's say it was your kid that's eight years old and you're taking them to the doctor because you know they're not feeling well and they, it looks like they have something and they test on biofire let's say the mycoplasma all right or rsv all right and they'll go oh it's so you know everything's okay don't worry about it all right and you need to stop them and say doctor prove to me that my child does not have an immune disorder especially since we just went through something that was extremely strange in 2020, all the way through 2023. Prove to me that the CD4 cells are effective. And don't say that you think you understand this because any doctor that thinks that they're understanding this, just looking at the microbiology of it, and not understanding the immunological part of the post-COVID era is a doctor that is, is flying blind. I am dead serious about this. If you have a child or if you have a, uh, you know, a parent that's ge geriatric and you're starting to see that they have something like this, like an RSV, influenza, mycoplasma, whatever, right? Adenovirus, whatever, all right? You need to question the doctor and say, prove to me that the CD4 positive cells are effective. Not the count, the cells that are effective, prove it. And I bet they can't. I'm willing to bet you they can't. It's just a little bit less than we had a year ago. Remember about a year ago, we had the this, American Academy. This broad doesn't Academy know what the fuck she's talking about. For the country to do something because the entire country was overwhelmed. Here, what we're seeing in Ohio, I'm sure we'll see in other states, but not at that kind of simultaneous emergency crisis we saw a year ago. I have mixed feelings about, um, you know, just a little bit of backstory on, on the, when I heard yeah. about the H1 N1. Wait, a little backstory on. The, re the reporter or the, the anchor. I think his name's Joe. And he has a master's in molecular biology. And then he left science and went into trading and then ended up being a host on CNBC. And, you know, he was hired. CNBC used to be owned by GE and that was under Jack Welsh. And, you know, so he transitioned from science to trading, to reporting on financial news, all right? So he has a strong background in molecular biology. So keep that in mind. Actually, he probably knows more at the molecular level than she does. You know, following the pandemic, how we view these things, doctor. And when I heard yeah. about the H1N1, uh, in, in the past, before the before COVID, we had seen we had seen swine flu, we had seen bird flu, right. we had seen dogs, we had seen and, and nothing ever turned into a pandemic. Now we know that it can happen. So now when I see H one N one, it's like, oh my god, could that be the next one? Are we uh, overly paranoid about it happening again, or justly 
uh, worried about a, a repeat. I, I mean, I'm coming from a public health kind of scientific perspective. I think we're just enough worried, and maybe we need to do a little bit more on surveillance on the swine flu piece, especially in the UK. That was the first time they'd seen kind of an unusual case of transmission, something where they couldn't just find the kind of precise kind of vector of that transmission. Normally it is from an animal to a human, and that doesn't raise much suspicion. But in this case, there was really no known kind of reason for that case. And that triggers, I think. I said three years ago, fourth and fifth cocktail. The fourth cocktail involves influenza. And you have a few cases that show either avian or swine. And then all of a sudden, some weird merge for what we just went through. And that will be a sign. If BioFire was showing positive influ influenza and corona, um, you have more indication of fourth cocktail being released. But it would those isolates would have to be sequenced to show that they're connected. The problem is that it's possible that there are chimeras where there are actually the, the virus has two genomes, and not just one. And so when you try to isolate and then sequence, you won't care. it would be hard to capture both of them, and you might miss it, and it flies underneath the radar. But she knows everything because she's dealing with public health. I can't, I don't know which one's dumber. Al Jazeera and covering the Israeli war with Hamas or this doctor dealing with the post era crisis that we're in. Nathan. Out of just worrying around public health surveillance, we just need to watch and see what else is happening. And we have those mechanisms in place. In the United States, we actually had a similar case earlier this year in August. So. All the things that kind of heighten our awareness in the media, the public health community has been doing this for years. I think now we just need to be aware that this, as you mentioned, can lead to epidemics, to even potentially pandemics. But we've come a long way, Joe, with COVID and wastewater surveillance. We now have kind of a global level of monitoring that didn't even exist even two years ago. So yeah. it's just to worry about it, but we should also be appropriately responsive, which is the UK, which is what the World Health Organization are doing in China, the UK, backs. and in the United States. We, we, we're out of time, but I was going to ask you about China, whether it really is a sort of a it's, immune uh, you know, the, a the debt. Yeah, they right. haven't seen things right. in a while because it's been closed right. down, and maybe that's what it is. I was also going to ask you whether is that lab still open? Are there labs around the world we need to worry about in terms of safety? Let's benefits? go to commercial. Not to say that we definitively know that that was responsible, but I would hope that, that people were in P4 type containment settings at this point on any of this stuff. Uh, that mm -hmm. maybe. Right. Yeah, that's what we we would we have we have that uh, as our working assumption, but as Ronald yeah. Reagan said, trust trust but verified, Joe. Trust but yes, this is again yeah, hopefully hopefully all all seasonal normal viruses. China's just seeing that kind of in that spate of patterns that we saw previously. AIDS like syndrome. It could be temporary. It could be far lasting. We don't know. We're we're. We're flying in, into the unknown. I suspect that it's going to be long lasting for certain people, especially if their immune system repair mechanism for recombination to create antibodies is inhibited or malfunctioning. Amazing. I'm just like, I'm just so. All right, now that's Bloomberg six. Here, let's uh, let's filter for something that's maybe today. I don't know. All right, let's um, let's play Indian State on high alert. All right, let's let's. 
Asia from needing visas to visit the world's second largest economy. From the 1st of December to the 30th, in China for business, tourism, visiting relatives and friends, or transiting for no more than 15 days will not need a visa. The move is aimed at boosting post pandemic tourism. But with concerns over undiagnosed pneumonia outbreak, is Beijing once again looking the other way and endangering the global population? In China, there has been a spike in cases of pneumonia in children. China says the surge is linked to circulation of several types of pathogens, mainly influenza. But this wave of pneumonia outbreak, it has the world on edge, and for good reason. It's brought back memories of the mystery pneumonia outbreak back in 2019 in Wuhan, one that later will be recognized, came to be recognized as the harbinger of the COVID-19 pandemic. So understandably, this wave has raised concerns and the fact that the Netherlands too reported cases of pneumonia in children soon after does not inspire much confidence. And in light of this, New Delhi is leaving no stone unturned to be better prepared this time around. Several states, in a proactive approach, are overhauling their medical infrastructure to ensure better surveillance and preparedness. As is the case with China, always there appears to be a lack of transparency with regards to this outbreak. My name is Hain Korsura, and to discuss this, we have with us Dr. Vivek Nangya, Chief of Pulmonology, Critical Care, Max Healthcare India. Thank you so much for joining us, Doctor. Thank you. Now, Doctor, to begin with the spike in pneumonia cases in China, do you see this as an ominous sign, especially since there were also reports of a surge in pneumonia cases from the Netherlands? Actually, going back into history, some information about the pneumonia, not the complete one. And the the significant part here is again that we don't know what virus or bacteria. Damn it. They have attributed it to a series of uh, bacteria like mycoplasma pneumonia, then some virus. Hold on, let me try to reset this. as you mentioned as well. What's your assessment of how this might play out? So it is really very difficult to say. See, what happens is whenever there's an outbreak like this, there are two things that we need to keep in mind. That the outbreak usually happens when people don't have a good immunity towards the virus. And that usually happens when it's a new onset virus. So we're just hoping that there's no new bug that has got created. There was also a rumor in between that there's an H9N2 being attributed to it. H9N2 is a kind of an influenza virus, which also has its origin in the animals, in the poultry, basically. So again, if there is a recombination of some kind of a strain in the poultry and then spilled over into humans, then there's always a risk of it spreading rapidly. So two things, as I said, which are important for us to bring, it has to be some new virus which has come into the, the environment into our, uh, you know, the environment around us. And second is that uh, we have no exposure to that kind of an immunity. As a result, we are facing the brunt of this illness. Right. Now, Indian states are on high alert as well. Seth. He's missing the fact that it could be not just, you know, there are versions of influenza that are new that we don't have an immunity for. And so that's part of the problem. But some of these other pathogens that are popping up in, in China, we should have immunity for. Unless they end up mutating because of selection pressure with overuse of antibiotics. So it's really a function of how many people within that society have a weakened immune system or a underreactive immune system. And it flies underneath the, the radar. Country, the way these people you think. Could be observing what kind of viral strains are prevailing in the society. One is that. Second thing that I would want to strongly recommend to everybody is that as soon as you come down with a cold and cough, you should isolate yourself. You know, irrespective of it's a common cold you feel or it's an allergy, because ultimately this is our social responsibility towards the people around us, towards our loved ones, towards our family, our colleagues. 
Isolating yourself till your acute phase is over is very, very essential, whatever it may be. You know, for somebody who's healthy, it may just be a mild infection, but somebody who is an immunocompromised state or elderly or has been under chemotherapy or on steroids or those kind of medicines which suppress your immunity, and then even a mild infection can turn out to be very severe and life threatening. Third is that I think we should go back to our social distancing, not going to overcrowded places. Avoiding, uh, you know, parties, large gatherings. Fourth is that we should follow cough etiquette. So even if you have a mild cough, you should always cough in your uh, in your arm, in your sleeve, and not openly without any hanky or a tissue paper with you. And of course, uh, the highly vulnerable group, that is the elders, the younger youngsters, as in five years of old, five years of age, those who are suffering with any comorbidity should also be getting the influenza vaccine, which will prevent you from getting this common cold also. Of course, there are concerns that China is yet again looking the other way, perhaps risking states across the globe. Do you think the world is prepared for yet another health scare, considering states have just started to emerge from the stranded world of COVID-19? See, whatever we may say or do, if there's a surge like COVID-19, then again, we can never be prepared for it. You know, whatever preparation we may put into place, you can never be prepared for it. Like even in India, if you remember in the initial part 2019, 2020 beginning, we were quite all right with the kind of number of cases that were happening. But then in suddenly in May, April 2021, there was a Delta wave which came, which devastated all of us completely. So you can never really be prepared despite all your preparation. The devastation can be huge. But yes, we are definitely better off than we were then. Right. Now, of course, the WHO has demanded more information on this outbreak. How do you see this playing out in that regard? In fact, what I mean by this is what sort of information are we looking at here and how would that help? So basically, I think WHO needs to play a greater role now, get the exact information as to what virus or what bacteria or what pathogen is really circulating. It is most likely some kind of virus only because bacteria and bacterial infections usually don't spread so rapidly. Second is that they have to ensure that there is adequate control measures being taken in China to control the spread of the infection to other parts of China and other parts of the world as well. So these are the two things that they need to be actively involved in and uh, be able to caution all of us as to what next we can do to prevent this from coming into our country. All right. Well, Dr. Nanya, thank you so much for joining us on Beyond with your insights of this. Thank you. There's only one theory that explains all this, and that is AIDS-like syndrome. This idea that there's a new pathogen that's creeping up because of, you know, animals and, you know, with swines and, 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 you know, birds, avians, and all this stuff, all right? There is more probability that it is because of the weakening immune system and these opportunistic infections are taking hold and it leads to mutations that could get worse down the stream. It's AIDS-like syndrome. Now, that's where we're at right now. What's scary is, is that this could be cover for something that's released on top. And it fools people, especially physicians that are used to seeing something that's okay. Mycoplasma, RSV, mycoplasma, RSV, influenza, that's all their patients. And all of a sudden something new comes up and biofire is all negative, right? Or get it even more complicated. Patients are worse. It's mycoplasma positive, and there's a new manifestation, and no one has done an isolate, or you know has isolates, or has isolated the you know a pathogen that is seems to be synergistic to what's going on. All right, so you know. At this point in time, I think it's opportunistic infections because of a weakening immune system. It's AIDS-like syndrome. And it's AIDS-like syndrome and not immune pause because it's happening around the world. And the countries that it's happening in right now are because, are, are, um, are, are way out of its mandate phase compared to, you know, in, in compared to China. 
all right? Now the question is how bad will this get? Do I think that it'll be anywhere near the levels of, of epi curve like we saw in the previous crisis? No, I don't think so. What is worrisome though is, is that will this be a long lasting AIDS-like syndrome that is chronic, right? Or is this something that's just short-lived with these children? We don't know. We don't know. And I suspect that if you over inoculate, that you'll make the, the immune system worse. And you don't have too many doctors that are that are saying that in the news. They're all pushing a similar agenda. This is not, most of them are saying it's not new. We know what it is, we know how to treat it. In some cases, we are starting to see resistance to the antibiotics, but don't be concerned and go get your inoculation. That's their mantra. What I'm saying is that the inoculations are probably weakening the immune system even further. And that you have patients that have, have enough of a weakened immune system to allow for these opportunistic infections to take hold. And that there are gonna be tertiary effects because of the way we're treating it in mass, leading to selection pressure that will circumvent antibiotics. You're not seeing anybody saying that. There's the problem. COVID-19, however, China denies any new virus behind the spike. And a correspondent, Susan Karani, spoke with the Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, regarding the rise in the number of pneumonia cases in China. Listen to what he had to say on this. In the U.S., the Congressional Committee has sent a letter to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, demanding that it that the dis the illness in China should be made more transparent, stressing that the agency could not repeat its pandemic era mistakes. While last week, the World Health Organization had asked China to provide more information about the illness. And in India, the government has issued an advisory regarding the respiratory illness in China. Several states have put out advisories to review the health infrastructure. This includes Rajasthan, Karnataka, Gujarat, Uttarakhand, Haryana, and Tamil Nadu. This after the Indian government asked different states to review their preparedness to tackle flu and other illnesses in the country. Now let's take a look at how these Indian states are preparing themselves. Starting with Karnataka, where the state health minister has informed hospitals to be prepared, do some mock drills, and see the availability of oxygen, beds, and PPE kits. In Tamil Nadu, the state is very carefully probing fever. Let me go to a commercial here because this is PNN. <coughs> Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get this, the silver solution or the Max 35 or Max 14. This is a structural nano silver that you take with a tea, take a teaspoon of this a day, gargle with it, swish it in your mouth for about 30 seconds or so, swallow it, and what it'll do is it'll neutralize pathogens. This is a 30 ppm, max 35 is 35 ppm, max 14 is 14 ppm. If you're sick, take a table, or take a, uh, a tablespoon or two a day. I take a teaspoon of it a day just for normal use, but if I'm not feeling well, I'll take one or two tablespoons. Get your vitamin C. On my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, it's an antioxidant, but it, it's also important so that you will have proper skin health, all right? You need vitamin C, actually, with drinking filtered water and collagen to have the proper linking in the dermal layer. And a lot of people are, you know, don't have, have enough vitamin C if they don't 
eat fruits. So please add this to your protocol and it'll improve your, your skin. And not just that, it is, an, it is an antioxidant. It's not as strong as C60 though for antioxidant purposes, but it will help with the immune system. So when you're sick, you take some more vitamin C. Everybody does that. I mean, we've been doing that for many, many, many decades. All right. Since we're talking about antioxidants, take C60. It's a it's an extremely potent antioxidant. You take a teaspoon of it a day, and you, you, it's best if you take it on an empty stomach, like in the morning, right? Take a teaspoon of it a day, and you, what you, what it'll do is it'll soak up the reactive oxygen species, all those free radicals, right? And by doing that, you're going to improve the mitochondrial health of the cell. You're going to have less cellular stress and improve ATP, which is the energy source that your cells need, is the main energy source. So if you do this, even before a workout, you'll recover quicker, all right? But you follow this protocol that I have. You take this every day, a teaspoon of this a day, you're going to start seeing that your body, you're going to have more energy, but not just that, you're going to actually start to age slower and your body will, will heal. And, you're, and by doing that, you're going to have the energy to be able to have a better immune system. So this is a, a, a great antioxidant. Take also turmeric, like I was mentioning before. Ashwagandha will... It will help with that inflammatory response because of the blood glucose levels. Turmeric will bring down that inflammation and improve your, your health, right? You're bringing down that inflammation, right? But it's also an antioxidant. So there's a key to my protocol. Neutralize pathogens with special nanosilver. Take strong antioxidants. Like ris, like risveratrol, and C sixty, and take supplements like turmeric and ashwagandha to bring down that inflammation, and then you add stuff to it, such as probiotics. All right, to get the proper gut biome, and you're going to be able to absorb your food better. You're going to have a, a better communication between your gut and your liver and you're gonna have a better communication between your gut and your brain. Vitamin D3, very important for calcium absorption, but also for gene expression. It helps to get rid of apoptose cells. And that's really important when you're not feeling well and they've been infected. Clarity factor, this compound will reduce brain fog. And by reducing brain fog, you are going to be able to concentrate better at work or at school. I did twice a day in the morning and mid afternoon. You can take it, you know, um, most people would take it in, in the morning. But um, the, the bottom line here is, is that get those neurons firing regularly. Take this regularly. You'll get rid of that brain fog. And what will happen is, is those dendrite connections will improve and, and expand. And what will happen is, is that your neuroplasticity will get better. Your neurons will fire more, especially when you're taking clarity factor and the C60. The C60 is going to improve your mitochondrial health. Well, the C60 is also going to improve the mitochondrial health that's in your neurons. And those neurons need a lot of ATP. So if you're aging and you have poor mitochondria or the number of mitochondria has gone down. You don't have as much ATP to have those neurotransmitters firing and the dendrites start to recede and you have less connections. So you don't think as fast. You're not as sharp. Your memory is starting to, to fade. Take clarity factor. That's going to improve your memory. It's going to keep, get you to, to, to focus and you won't have that brain fog and keep those dendrite connections active, right? And taking a strong antioxidant like C60, I, I have it in avocado and coconut, two ounce, four ounce, and eight ounce. Take it, and it's going to help improve, improve those, that ATP from the mitochondria. 
And then, like I said, another very good antioxidant is resveratrol, right? This coupled with other things will help if you follow it, you know, if you follow it regularly, there'll be a compound effect and you're gonna age slower. All right, your skin's gonna get better, your memory's gonna get better, your immune system is gonna get better, you're gonna have more energy, your your and then you 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 look at your lifestyle. It's about proper diet, proper exercise, proper new proper supplementation, proper brain challenging, like reading, writing, proper stretching, right? As I was telling you about stretching and balancing, don't get all crazy. You don't have to get crazy about it, but stretch a little bit and, and, and improve your balance and you're going to improve. What what people have been finding is, is that part of centurions were like they, they had a social network. They talked to people, you know, they were also uh, moving around, like walking. And they were, they had some of these balancing exercises. And it doesn't have to be crazy, right? You don't have to become a, a guru at yoga or anything like that. But these are important features. And you couple all this together, you're going to slow down that aging process. So those are some of the products that I have on the store. Please go to the store, the-studio-rakefit.com. The link is in the description of this video. But seeing the rise in cases of respiratory illnesses in the US, a congressional committee has sent a letter to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention demanding it to be more transparent regarding the mysterious outbreak of pneumonia in China, stressing the agency could not repeat its pandemic era mistakes. While last week, the World Health Organization had asked China to provide more information about the illness. And in India, the government has issued an advisory regarding the respiratory illness in China. Several states have put out advisories to review the health infrastructure. This includes Rajasthan, Karnataka, Gujarat, Uttarakhand, Haryana, and Tamil Nadu. This after the Indian government asked different states to review their preparedness to tackle flu and other illnesses in the country. So I think that is a good base of understanding of where we're at right now as of December 3rd, okay, worldwide. Everyone is thinking it's just common pathogens that are known and we know how to treat them. The groups are primarily pediatrics, but it's also affecting the elderly. And it is primarily in China, but it is starting to emerge elsewhere in the world. So that's the fog of war, we're right at the edge. I have explained to you that I, think that what explains this whole dynamic that happened a year ago and now is AIDS-like syndrome. And there is a, there's a, there's a underactivity, maybe short-term, but it might be long-term for the immune system, especially in the pediatric patients. So, you know, this is going to be an evolving story. I do not think that this is going to ramp up into anything that we saw before, right? But it's concerning because we don't know if these things are going to be long-lasting problems for children, especially if the immune deficiency is long-lasting or, or, or um, you know, chronic or there's a latent phase to it. Uh, we don't know, and we're going into the unknown here again. But I don't think, I, I don't sense that this is going to be as catastrophic in terms of number of cases, number of deaths, um, or lockdowns or anything like that, like we had in, in, in the prior crisis in 2020.
what I am concerned is fourth cocktail. And what I'm also concerned is the the emergence of some sort of um, influenza that is not associated with the fourth cocktail. So you can have an influenza outbreak or the fourth cocktail. The probability is, is that there's a higher probability of just an influenza outbreak that, you know, is swine or avian, right? That could be very, very problematic. If it takes hold, you know, and, it, and it's severe enough, then you may see dynamics that were similar to 2020. If the fourth cocktail is released, you'll see dynamics that are like 2020 and maybe even worse. But I'm more focused on this episode of the post era. And I predicted that this was going to happen. In the post era, you're going to have cancers. You're going to have AIDS-like syndrome, where it's opportunistic infections that are taking hold up to the point that if it's really severe, certain types of cancers start to pop up. And you have autoimmune disorders, where your immune system is overreactive and attacking, attacking cell. All right. So keep that in mind. The thrombocytopenia was in a, some of it was immune thrombocytopenia. So, uh, you know, pay attention to this. This is an episode that's going to be uh, somewhat of a somewhat muted compared to the catastrophe that went that we went through in 2020. But there may be tertiary effects that happen selection pressure because of treatment that leads to less viability of the antibiotics, especially when you're treating you know, millions and millions of people in India and in China, right? This is a problem. And like I said, you know, energy, you know, electricity and antibiotics are big components, big pillars for a modern society. And if we lose one of those pillars, our, our society is going to go back into the dark ages. So uh, pay attention. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the structural nanosilver, neutralized pathogens, get the C60, bring down the reactive oxygen species and the, the free radicals, and get the tumor and ashwagandha to bring down the inflammation. And add stuff to it like the B complex and the probiotic and the D3 and the vitamin C and the zinc and the digestive enzymes, the clarity factor, the resveratrol. There's a ton of really good products that I have. You can also go and take a look at my anti-aging boxes. If you don't know what you want to get, you know, take a look at how I curated those boxes. I have them at different pricing points and you can, you know, pick an anti-aging box that has been curated for you for, for a particular level of, of, of the anti-aging protocol, or you can buy individual products. It's up to you, but please go to my store, the-studio-rankinic.com. I will do a series of videos on this. Some of those videos will be able to stay up on YouTube. Some of them will not be. So please make sure you subscribe to all my channels so you can see the work. Thank you for listening. Please share the links, especially the ones on Rumble and, and the ones that stay up on YouTube. Um, and please, if you can, tell your social network to subscribe. I am heavily censored on YouTube. And they every time I post, they bleed my account. They bleed the, the subscribers. Right? So please. And they've been doing this for four years now. So please. Pay attention to what I have to say because it's unique and it may actually save, save your life. So thank you for listening and have a nice day.